No, that's not going to work. But anyway, just want to make sure I don't go over. They gave me uh, 60 minutes this time, right, Pastor Bob? <laughs> Limitless? Okay. But all joking aside, I just want to pray for um, us as a congregation, us as a church. Pray for uh, Pastor Pat, who is you know, dealing with some things, and we're just uh, trusting the Lord. We'll uh, see her through. So, Father God, we just praise you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We thank you, my God, for your presence in our lives. We thank you, my God, for your word that is literally a light into our paths, Father God. We worship you, my God, and we give you thanks as we open up your bread of life. I pray that you would anoint my lips, Father God, and that the message you've placed in my heart, Father God, that you would just allow me to share it with your people, with your church, with your body, clearly and succinctly. We pray for Pastor Pat, that you would be with her today, even as uh, she's in her home. We pray, my God, that your Holy Spirit continue to be with her and minister with minister her to her even now. Amen. So last time I was with you guys, I mentioned that I tried to continue with the book of 2 Corinthians as we're kind of inching our way through 2 Corinthians. And as I prepared my last message a couple months ago, it was like the lights were out. I got nothing. And God had actually impressed upon me at that time to bring to you a message about his vision for the church, which was one body united in Christ, loving God and loving others. But something actually happened to me Friday evening that helped me to kind of crystallize and bring into view how the Lord works when we approach his word. So we had the, our grandkids staying over this weekend, uh, the two, Elijah and uh, Catalina. Their parents are, are away. There was death in the family, so they had to attend a funeral. But Elijah was with us, and we were down in the basement, sleeping in the basement on the you know, comfortable bed there. And I became a guero. Guero is what they call me. They don't say grandpa. They call guero. I became a guero sandwich, stuck in the middle. Catalina on this side, Elijah on this side. And I could barely turn neither left nor right, but that's, a, that's another message. But Elijah had to use the bathroom in the middle of the night. And we had a nice night light where we were, and the light to the bathroom was on, but the light at the bottom of the stairs was off. I was like, Guero, I got to use the bathroom. Like, go, okay, go, 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 you'll be fine. <laughs> no, Guero, it's dark, I'm afraid. All right, so what do I have to do? Have to walk behind him with my phone's flashlight illuminating his little steps, illuminating his little steps. And that became like an aha moment to me in how the Holy Spirit shines his light upon his word. So when I reapproached 2 Corinthians, the light bulb was on. Okay, I can get back into 2 Corinthians. So, if you would turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6 now. We're in chapter 6. I'll be reading from verses 1 through about verse 13. And if you wouldn't mind standing with me as I read, just to give reverence and honor to the Word of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 reads as follows. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, it is a favorable time. I listen to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. And Paul says, behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. But we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, 
kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, the truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors, yet are true, as unknown, yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You were not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak to you as children. Widen your hearts also. Amen. You, be, you may be seated. And that is the message of my, the title of my message today. Hearts wide open. Hearts wide open. Paul begins this particular chapter by saying, working together with him, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. When we look at scripture, it's important for us to know that these letters didn't originally have verse and chapter. They were meant to be read in one sitting. So in order for me to understand who it is, he, who is it that he's talking about when we say, when he says, working together with him, we need to kind of go back a little bit to chapter 5. We see in that epistle that Paul was <clears throat> regarding nobody in the flesh. Verse 17 says, everyone who is a new creation, who, anybody who is in Christ is a new creation. Behold, the old has passed away and the new one has come. And when we see this word behold, it's like a big exclamation point. It's in bold letters with neon lights. Behold, take a look at this. Notice this. Behold, if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. Everything has passed away. And you have become new. All has become new. He talks about in chapter 5, this ministry of reconciliation where Jesus Christ is bringing us to himself. And he gives us this ministry. He gives each and every one of us this ministry of reconciliation. To reconcile means to bring two things that were once apart together. So we in our sins are apart from Christ. Through Christ, we are brought together. We're reconciled to God. That is the ministry that God has given each and every one of us. The ministry of reconciliation. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Not counting our sins against us. But entrusting us with this message of reconciliation. Isn't that really interesting? The words that are used here. And we believe that every word of God is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says that he is entrusting you with this message. He's entrusting you with this message. That we know that our sin separates us from God, but there's this plan, this great plan of salvation through the blood of Christ to bring us into right relationship with God. That message lives in the heart of every Christian. And it is our duty to share that message with the world. Paul even begs, he pleads, he begs, he urges the Corinthians to be reconciled to God. Because he that knew no sin was made sin for us. The God of, who was the creator of the heavens and the earth, who spoke everything into existence, who knew no sin, came down, to this earth was made flesh and experienced every temptation that we could, yet sinned not. He lived a pure life, the life that we could not live, yet still went to the cross in obedience to the Father and died the death that we should live 
so that we can now live the life that we could not live apart from him. So when he says, working together with him, that's what he's talking about. Working this ministry of reconciliation, working out this gospel, the sharing of the gospel, together with Jesus. He says, I, in verse 1, now we're getting back to 6. In verse 1, we appeal to you not to receive the, va- the grace of God in vain. Did you know that you could receive the grace of God in vain? That is a scary thought. That's a scary thought. And here Paul, being a a studied Hebrew Jewish person, understood Old Testament prophecies. And he's actually quoting Isaiah 49, 8 here. In a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, have helped you. All the Jewish people understood that. All the Jewish people heard it and understood that was a message of the Messiah. That was the message of salvation. That God was going to hear our prayers, that God was going to hear our afflictions, that God was going to understand that apart from him, in our sin and trespass, we are dead. He says, in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Here, Paul says, behold, twice. Behold, now is a favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, now, now is a day for you to accept the salvation of the Lord. That was Paul's primary concern throughout all of his ministry. He was primarily concerned with the salvation of people. He was primarily concerned with the souls of the people he came in contact with. That was it. Because he understood the condition of his soul before he was saved. He understood his end if he had died apart from Christ. And because of the great amount of grace that God had poured upon Saul, Paul, he wanted to share that with others. But he worked very, very hard. He says, he doesn't want you to receive the word of God in vain, to receive this message in vain. To receive something in vain would be for it to be without success, without result, without effect, without the renewing power or regeneration that comes with this ministry of reconciliation. You know, there's that old saying, it kind of goes in one ear and out the other. That's what he's saying. Don't receive it and let it go in one ear and out the other. Let it stick into your heart. Let it take effect. Let the Holy Spirit convict you of your trespasses and your sins and your iniquities so you can bring it forth and repent of those things. And Christ can apply his blood to those things so that when the day of judgment comes, Christ doesn't see any of our spots or blemishes. He sees white robes that were washed in the blood of Christ. And I couldn't understand that when I first became Christian. How is it possible that these robes are washed in blood, but they're white? I couldn't understand that. Because if you ever had like a blood stain on a white shirt, it's like impossible to get out. There's products nowadays I think they can, but I didn't understand it that by, by that point. But he's not speaking in a physical sense of whiteness or purity, uh, uh, whiteness. He's talking about spiritual purity. It is through the blood of Christ that we can achieve spiritual purity. And only the spiritually pure will be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven because God is a holy God and he sits in a holy heaven. That's why Satan and his demons had to be cast out because of their rebellion. There was impurity found within them. So they were cast out. The only way we can enter into heaven is by the blood of Christ. Not by our works. And I'll give you a story, an anecdote later on towards the end of my message. Um, This week I had an opportunity to speak to a family member about this very topic, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. So he says, behold, now is the time to receive the salvation. 
Now is the time. And saying behold twice is putting like double exclamations on it. But Paul worked very hard not to place any obstacle in the way of people receiving the true word of the gospel. Look at verse 3, chapter 6, verse 3. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found in our ministry. It's really interesting. He was so concerned about people receiving the pure, unadulterated gospel that he tried his best to just sink into the background, especially when he was face-to-face -face with people. He tried to make minimize himself. And this man was a powerful man of God. You read the book of Acts, man, he comes on the scene and it's revolutionary. But whenever he's out there ministering, visiting towns, visiting cities, spreading the gospel, establishing churches, he tries his best to minimize himself so that God can be glorified, so that the word of God, the gospel, could be glorified. So he's telling them, I put no obstacles in front of you. There's no reason for you not to receive this because I've put nothing between myself and the word. You're just getting the pure word. Because there were people in the time who were preaching the word also, but they were also putting obstacles in place of these people. One of those obstacles was, yeah, here's the word of God, here's the gospel, but you have to do this and you have to do this and you have to do that in order to be saved. When the word of God says in order to be saved, all you need to do is repent and believe. Pure at the end, simple. It's a simple gospel. Believe in the word of God and repent. Turn away from your sins. Period. That's it. But there are people in the time saying, you've got to be circumcised. You can't touch this. You can't touch that. You can't eat this. You can't eat that. So there were, these people were putting obstacles in front of the gospel in order for people to be saved. Abstain from or don't eat food that was offered to idols. Again, putting obstacles. And Paul spoke out about this often. But there were other obstacles, more subtle obstacles that were put in the way. And those obstacles came in the form of offenses. He was very, very careful, again, like I said, when dealing with people, especially in person, to be very gentle, meek and mild, not to offend anybody. His letters were a different story. If you read Paul's letters, they were forceful. They were to the point. They were in your face. They were confronting. But when he was in front of people, he was a bit different. And because of this difference, people began to question his authenticity. They began to question whether or not he was actually called to be a minister. They were kind of missing the point. What he was also trying to say is that, you know, as Christians, we have great freedom in Christ. We have tremendous freedom. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, it says, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. I want us to, I want us to kind of chew on that for a little bit. There's tremendous freedom in Christ. All things are lawful, yet not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not everything builds you up. So we have two opposite extremes here. I'm going to use some technical terms, but I'll explain to you what they are. Legalism on one end, and something called antinomianism on the other. And I'll explain what those mean. Legalism basically states that you must follow all these laws, legalism, laws, right? You have to follow all these laws. Do this, do that, don't do this, do, do that. You might see some churches where um, women have to dress a certain way or do certain things, and there's, it's, it's, we, call the, we call that legalism. And they believe that if you don't do that, then your salvation is in jeopardy. That's heretical. It's not true. 
What do we need to be saved? Believe and repent. Believe and repent. However, you have on the opposite extreme, some people will take that and say, and take these verses, and say, well, that means I can do whatever I want. I can live la vida loca. I can live a crazy life. That's not true either. So, Paul in his ministry is trying to kind of get people to understand that yes, it's very, very, the gospel is a very simple gospel. But once a person, like I said at the very beginning, when we kind of re, that's why I wanted to review some of chapter five. All things are made new. All the old things have passed away and all the new, everything has been made new. So that which you once were, you're no longer. So as you grow about your life, uh, growing as a Christian, there's a certain level of transformation. The Holy Spirit begins to work in your life and transforms your life. And I've said this before, if, you know, we have to be careful about examining our own lives and making sure that we are, you know, living out the life that God has called us to live. So I don't, and I might just jump into that story about that person from my family. We were having conversations about this particular topic. And what does a person need to be saved? And my family member was... God bless them in error. They said, you have to be good. You have to do good. You have to do more good than more evil. Like, well, I asked them, well, how much more good than evil? Is there a percentage? 50%? 50%? 51%? 49%? And I wasn't making, like, a joke of it. I'm, I'm, like, I'm trying to understand their thought process. Like, well, what about if it's 99% good and 1% evil? Is God going to let that 1% evil into heaven? Like, is it... The point is... The point is that the salvation comes to us as a free gift of God. And like I said earlier, there's nothing that I can do for it. And I asked the person, do you know anybody who is 100% good? And my wife was sitting next to me. And she said, yes, I do. And she said, you, pointing to me, talking about me. And the first thing my wife did was laugh. And I know why my wife laughed, because I live with her. And she knows that I'm far, far, far from perfect. But there's this misunderstanding that because I live a life that is, you know, it's like, because I don't do this or don't do that or don't do that, that is going to get me into heaven. No. It's flipped. Christ died for me. Christ saved me. Therefore, I don't do those things. Because I'm not bound to sin. I'm not a slave to sin anymore. I am freed from sin. I no longer have to do those things. So I went and continued to talk to this person and kind of help her understand. Oh, I said gender. I was trying to keep it very neutral to keep that person anonymous. But anyway, I told her. God's gift of salvation is there for you. And he's not waiting for you to, you know, clean up your act. Because nothing you do, even the best things you do, apart from him, are as filthy rags. It's, they're, they're nothing. But again, some people would take this freedom that we have in Christ and think that we can then live this life of, you know, unhinged debauchery. Paul even says, well, because God's grace abounds, does that mean I get to sin and do whatever I want? And Paul says, absolutely not. Do not let it be so. Do not let it be so. So we do not, as Christians, get to heaven because we don't do this or that or do this or that. We're saved by Christ's blood. We're saved by his grace. But because we have been saved and because we have been transformed, we have the power to now live according to the word of God. 
And it is only through the Word of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit that we have the ability to live a righteous life. And doesn't mean that we live a perfect life. And again, if that person were around me more often, they'd see how imperfect I was. But anyway. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whatever you do, eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God so that no one, and you, that you do not give offense to the Jews or the Gentiles or to the church of God. So there were people who, because they had this great freedom, knew that they could eat whatever they want. And let's keep it simple with the food right now because it's very, very concrete. And we know that Jewish culture, uh, pork, is... Um, you know, not kosher. So most Jewish people will not eat pork. So these people who were Jews converted to Christianity and they realized we have this freedom now. We're no longer bound to the law. I can eat a pork chop. So they would eat pork chop and ham, whatever. But in front of other Jewish converts, and those Jewish converts would be very, very offended. So he's saying, whatever, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it for the glory of God so that no one is offended. If I'm sitting at a table with a person who is a new convert, and I know that what I'm going to put in my mouth is going to offend them, it's my duty to not eat that in front of them. To not do it. Because that's going to cause an obstacle. Because in that person's mind, they don't understand that freedom. In time they may, but you know, at that moment... I have to be conscious as a maybe a more mature brother just to put that to the side and not do something that's going to offend that person. So that's what Paul was worried about. That's what Paul concerned himself about. Not to put any obstacles in front of people that would prevent them from receiving the gospel in its fullness so that they didn't receive the gospel in vain. And what did this cause him? Verse 4 says, But as servants of God, we commend everything... We commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless nights, and hunger. I want to focus on that word servants real quick, the beginning of verse 4. A lot of times people will put ministers or preachers or pastors on a pedestal, almost like that person in my family did when they falsely assumed that I was a perfect person. But when you're put on a pedestal, sometimes you can begin to be very arrogant. You can develop an, a, a, a spirit of like arrogance or conceit, but it's not necessarily... It goes against what the word minister is, because the word minister means servant. I have to be up here just to be able to see everybody. But just because I'm on a platform doesn't mean I'm better than anybody or anyone who ministers is better than anyone. Jesus Christ himself said that he has come to serve, not to be served. And minister, minister of Christ is here to serve the Lord, but also serve his church. So if Jesus Christ said this, how much more should it be for the, the members of the body of Christ to have this disposition of service? In everything that we do, we should be looking to serve. And we know that there's a lot of need in the ministry in lots of areas where, you know, help is needed and needs that can be filled. But I want to ask you, who is the minister of God? Who is the minister of God? Is it simply the person that sits here, stands here? Or the people who might fill those offices or work over there? I tell you, no. Everyone hearing the word of God, who has believed the word of God, who has accepted the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins, is a minister of God. You're a servant of the Lord Most High. And as such... When things don't go our way, we have to follow Paul's example. Hey, look what he went through again. Great endurance, afflictions, hardships, beatings, calamities, 
gosh, someone looks at us the other wrong way in the church and we want to walk out the door. We're so touchy and fretful. That's not what God has called us to do. God has called us to endure these things with great endurance because he knows people are people. God knows people are people. And until we reach perfection in heaven, we're going to continue to sometimes offend each other and do things that don't, you know, we don't like. But what gave Paul the ability to press forward and not throw in the towel? Because I tell you, serving as a minister of the Lord is not easy. Serving as a Christian is not easy, especially in this world that is becoming more and more anti-Christ and anti-Christian by the day. It's going to get harder and harder. What gave Paul the ability to press forward? The end of verse, uh, verse 6 says, By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love. Verse 7 says, By truthful speech and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. Those were the tools, the weapons at Paul's disposal. That is what Paul used on a daily basis to be able to get through the things that he went through. Those are the things that we have at our disposal as well. Mark this in your Bible. Meditate on it at night. Purity, trying to maintain purity before God's eyes. It, making it your desire, making it your intent to live a life that he has called you to. Patience. That's a hard one for a lot of people. Enduring foolishness. Not getting things when you want them, but when God wants them. Kindness. You know how much kindness costs? Zero dollars. Kindness. Being kind to others. Important. The Holy Spirit. If you have, a, if you have your Bible, circle it. Trusting and the power of the Holy Spirit. Very important as well. Genuine love. Having genuine love for others. Because every person that you encounter was created in the image of God. Therefore, Regardless of language, regardless of national origin, even regardless of belief system, they are in, made in God's image. Therefore, I'm to love them as God loved them. By truthful speech, speaking that which is true, and most important, the word of God, the gospel. That is the most true word. And the power of God, the power of God, not on your own, there's no way we can get through these hardships that come to us as Christians or ministers of the word without God's power. So again, what does he have to go through? He goes through highs and lows, just like every one of us. Verse 8 says, through honors and dishonors, through slanders and praise, we're treated as imposters, yet we're telling the truth. As unknown, yet known, to, well known to others. As dying, yet behold, we live. As punished, yet not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. Listen to this, my friends. We're not talking about financial riches here. But if I give you the word of God, the gospel, and you accept that gospel as truth, and you convert to the Lord, you have inherited the most important thing in the world, which is the salvation of your eternal soul. <laughs> Having nothing yet, possessing everything. If you have nothing plus God, you have everything. Because God is eternal. And God is limitless. You need nothing else but God. How do we go through all these things? How do we, do we endure all these things? Because our focus is on the right thing. That we have been entrusted, as we said earlier, entrusted in this great ministry of reconciliation. Not for us to simply sit on our hands and wait for the Lord to come, but to share this word with others. 
to work for the church, to build up the body of Christ. And whatever the way the Lord, the Lord has given you talents, everyone has been given talents in a different measure, put them into practice. But I tell you, God, uh, Paul didn't really care about any of the things that he went through. He really didn't. He endured it all because he was faithful to his call. And he recognized that there was greater work and greater purpose at play. Verse 11 says, We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians, and our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. In return, I speak to you as children. Widen your hearts also. When I was doing this study, I came across this commentary that has some really interesting analogies. I want to read this to you real quick. There was no narrowness in him. In that large heart of his, there was room for them and for a thousand others. Imagine that. In Paul's room, there were room for all the people in Corinth and all the other people that he came in contact with. with. It had his, speaking about his heart, as it were, an infinite elasticity in its sympath sympathies. So imagine a, a rubber band. You stretch it and you stretch it and you stretch it. But imagine a rubber band that you can stretch forever. That's how Paul's heart was. Had so much love for others. However, the Corinthians, he's saying that their narrowness, their narrowness, they, they were kind of rigid. They didn't want to open up. They were constricted or constrained by their own passions, their own desires, their own lusts, their own prejudices and their own hates and their own judgments. When you have those things, it causes your heart to be narrowed and constricted. And what Paul is saying, open up your hearts. Meet with the people around you. Deal with your co-workers. Deal with your family. Deal with your neighbors. Deal with strangers with a with a heart wide open. But I will say it is very interesting because there's a need for discernment. You cannot simply just have a heart wide open and accept every wind of doctrine that comes your way. You have to be wise. That's why Paul says later on. In verse 6, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? For what fellowship does light have with dark? That in itself is a message for another day. But what I want to say is that even though Paul is saying to you, have your heart wide open, but he's also saying be cautious. Don't be a fool and don't be deceived. Because especially nowadays, as we get closer to the end times, we're going to see more and more people trying to deceive the church, to draw the people away from the truth of the gospel, who will preach a gospel that is no gospel at all. That will be a gospel where, oh, if you do this, do this and that, you will be saved. And we know that there are many people who believe that gospel. We have to have discernment. We cannot simply slap the label of Christianity on something and assume it is Christian. We have to have discernment. We have to be like the Bereans, the noble Bereans. As Paul was preaching, they opened up the scriptures. They checked, oh, does this line up with, with the word of God? Does this line up? Does this line up? They didn't just accept it. And even as I'm standing here, as I'm talking to you, I want you to go back and search the scriptures to make sure that what I'm saying aligns with the word of God. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the word of God. Test the uninspired words of man with the inspired words of God. Because even Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. So examine everything. Hold on to that which is good, embrace that which is good, and reject that which doesn't align with the Lord. So again, I'm going to go back to verses 1 and 2. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle 
in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. I want to end with the story of Felix in Acts 25. Felix was a Roman official, and he had knowledge about what was called the way. The way is what we used to call the church before we call the church the church. Before we were called Christians, we were called the way. So he knew about the way. He gave orders that Paul should be kept in prison, but he could have some liberty, that some, none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. So he gave him some ability to, you know, be with his friends. After some days, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewish woman, and he sent for Paul and heard him speaking about his faith in Christ. And as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and coming judgment, Felix was alarmed. He heard the good news. He heard the good news. He heard about this righteousness, this self-control, this coming judgment, and he was afraid. And what did he say? Go away for now. When I get the come when I get a chance, I'll call you back. Don't be like Felix. We don't know if Felix had another chance. We don't know if Felix had an opportunity to hear from Paul again or hear the word again. We have no idea. But I tell you, brothers and sisters, now, behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. If you have heard the word of the Lord today, if the Holy Spirit has ministered in your heart, if you have felt him tugging at you and calling you to repentance, now is the time for you to respond. Now is the time for you to respond. And it's a very, very, very simple response. Lord, I believe your word. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I re believe that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. I believe that Jesus Christ being the creator of the heavens and the earth saw fit to come down to this earth to die in my place. I believe his death has paid the price for all of my sins. I say again, all of my sins, past, present, and future. I believe it is done. That there's nothing else I can do to earn salvation because it is given to me freely. And freely I accept it. And from this point on, I pray that the Holy Spirit continue to minister in your heart and conform you and transform you into the image and likeness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, thank you for paying attention. Thank you for spending time with us today in worshiping God and in opening up His Word. And uh, let me just close out in prayer. Father God, as our brothers and sisters who make up your body leave this place and go about their business and go about their homes, I pray, Lord, that your Word will take root, Father. That those who do not know you, my God, can remember this word and heed your call. That even in the night seasons, Father God, when they're alone in their beds, that you would bring this word back to their hearts. And they would respond to your call, Father God. The call that is founded and rooted in your love. We give you praise, Father God. And for this congregation, I pray that the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. We praise you in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.